dear listeners to the Counter Narrative Podcast. Today we are in for a treat as we dive into a topic that challenges stereotypes and open our minds to new perspectives. I am Rihanna Ojo Oba and joining me is the incredible, beautiful and talented Tiara Oluwa Oluwa Bukumi Fade. Thank you Rihanna. We have a distinguished guest with us today, Dr. Chris Marsh, who has authored the remarkable book, The Love Jones Squad, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. Dr. Marsh, welcome to the Counter Narrative Podcast. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Marsh, in your study, you interviewed 62 black adults, 43 women and 19 men with an average age of 38. Can you enlighten us on the metrics and consideration that led to the selection of this group for your study? Oh, that's such a great question. So I had to make a hard, fast decision as a scholar on whether or not I just wanted to include black women in the cohort. And part of the reason why I had to decide that is because black women definitely dominate the category. And I am all about supporting black women, period, full stop. So I wanted, to, but, but I also wanted to be sensitive to the fact that there were men that had been interviewed. And so I, as a scholar, made the decision to include men in the conversation. Beca and I'm glad that I did for two reasons. One, because there were like some gender differences that showed up in the book. And if I hadn't have interviewed the men, it wouldn't have been possibly as clear. And I could talk about those if you want me to. The reason why I am really happy that I included men in the book is because my mentor was like, now if you want to, you can write a book all about just black women and, and submit that to like a trade press and make it much more accessible and more readable. And I was like, oh, so I have options and opportunities because I started with both men and women. But back to the first point, there were two things that I thought really were really fascinating that showed up. And I'm so glad that I included men, although they don't dominate the category. One centers around like the desire to be married and partnered. And a lot of women in the book talked about that they were hopeful that they might get married one day, although they were very happy with their single lives. But the men said, it's just a matter of time before they do get married. So men were very emphatic that they were just going to marry and women were hopeful. And, and me as, as a scholar, I grapple with what that means all the time. For the women, what it clearly signals to me as a sociologist is that they do want to be partnered and married, but they're not willing to settle. One of the reasons why I wrote this book is because I wanted to destigmatize singlehood. The title of the book is The Love Jones Cohort, and hopefully we can get a chance to talk about how the title came up. But the subtitle is called Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. And one of the things I wanted to do as a scholar is I really wanted to destigmatize singlehood because there are a lot of people that are in relationships that are oppressive, toxic, abusive, and unfulfilling simply because they don't want to hold the title of single. And so I wanted to write a whole book talking about singles and talking about how they navigate their single lives as opposed to asking them, why aren't you getting married? Why, aren't you, why don't you have any children? So the women in the book were like, I would like to be partnered, but it's gotta make sense. I'm not going to just settle for anybody to be in a relationship. But the men were like, oh, I'm going to get married at some point in time. So I do wonder if there's some level of settling with men and or if the men are picking like the better of the two options to just marry someone. And what does that mean about how how um, fulfilling that relationship might possibly be? So that's one thing, one gender difference that showed up. Another gender difference that showed up. And I'm really happy and excited about this because I think that this has real application. The black women in the cohort talked about how friends played a central role in how they navigated their single lives. And so sometimes people say singles are lonely and so on and so forth, but friends played a central role for these women. And so they, we took, the women talked a lot about non-romantic nurturing relationships, but the men in the cohort did not talk about having these non-romantic nurturing relationships. And a few of the men that did talk about friends, they talked about how they're not super close with their male friends because they may be thought of as being soft or they may be thought of as being gay. So they don't have these non-romantic nurturing relationships. So I do hope after reading the book, 
men can, we can normalize non-romantic nurturing relationships and people can be more inclined to be in those type of relationships. Black women tend to do that, but black men don't necessarily do that. So I hope the book has practical need usage for black men and they start having these non-romantic nurturing relationships. I feel like it captures so many things. You're talking about how men, when they, when they show affection, they're seen as soft or gay or some certain way. And these things are very important in our daily lives. We have we, we talk about female friendship with so much joy, the way we'll talk about sexual relationships as well. Oh, my friend gives me joy. I'm saying I love you to my friends. I'm hanging out with my friends. I'm holding my friend. But so many men are like, oh, I can't touch my male friend. Like, why yeah, can't you? Why so can't gay. you hug? Why can't you hug your male friend? What is wrong in being expressive towards your friend? So these right. conversations are so important. Yeah, and I really hope that people will, after reading the book, it's like we can really normalize that men can embrace and that doesn't mean that they're gay. They can talk to their friend and say, hey, I'm sad today and they're not thought of as being weak. Black women, we can do that and it's not a problem. And so here's the other thing that I think is really interesting. Um, a lot of people like think like, okay, if I can just get married, all of my issues will go away. If I can just get married, I can just get married. I'm like, first of all, why do people think if you get married, that's like the panacea is going to solve all of your ills? Okay. But what happens a lot of times is that men in particular, or people that are married, they put all of their eggs in the marriage basket. So they forsake their other friends and they just cultivate a relationship with their partner. But some of the data is really clear that sometimes, and I'm drawing from one of my colleagues who wrote a book called Happy Singlehood. And one of the things he suggests in his book is that people that are long-term never married, can be happier as they age. Part of the reason why they can be happier as they age is because they build a network. And so you have people that are married and they think that they're going to like be together forever, but for whatever reason, they find themselves returning back to singlehood, whether or not it's because widowed separation or divorce, but they put, why they return to singlehood, they just return to it, but they put all their eggs in the marriage basket. So now they have no friends and now they're older and they don't have a network to draw from. I have a network that I can go to church with, that I can play golf with, that I can use profanity with. Sometimes I use profanity. I admit it. People I can, friends, I can go to, I can go out to have brunch with. I have a different set of friends for very different things in my life. And that's really important. And and we really need to normalize the value in non-romantic nurturing relationships. We absolutely just have to. Fantastic. My goodness. I love this. Thank you Thank so, you so my much, Dr. Chris. So Love Jones cohorts, it challenges traditional media portrayals of black family, like the middle class family. And I'm sure that you would have gotten pushbacks from it. Can you tell us some of the pushbacks you got when you when you published the book? Okay. So I want to go on record saying this. I think I say it like in page three, paragraph four, line seven, that I am not anti-marriage and I am not anti-love. I am not. Here's what I'm trying to get people to understand though. I think when we think about marriage and we think, of, we think about black love, we think about marriage, we think about community, we think about it in a very narrow and focused kind of ways. And so when we think about the black middle class, a lot of the social science literature and media had a very specific view of what black middle class meant. And it was this heteronormative mother, father, 2.5 kids and a black picket fence. Yes. What I appreciate about that. So in America, when we think about like the quintessential or the typical black middle class or upper black middle class family, you would think about the Huxtables on the Cosby show. That was yeah. like the black middle-class family. Yeah. But where I'm really, really appreciative is that we started to see a demographic shift in the characters with the movie, The Love Jones. And in the characters in this movie were young, black, professional. They weren't married, didn't have children. And so when I, as a scholar, was trying to think about the black middle class and the way we have a very narrow view of what the black middle class does, I wanted to pay respect and homage to the show or the um, movie that actually started to change the tide to look at people that were young, professional, didn't, weren't married, didn't have any children. So that's why I called the book, The Love Jones Cohort. Cohort is nothing more than a traditional demographic term. But one of the things I argue in the book, and here's where I get a lot of pushback, People, two things. One, when people automatically read the title of the book, they think I'm saying, oh, black women don't need no black man. We can do it on our own and blah, 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 blah. 
simply because I have the word single in there, single and living alone, I get hate mail from people saying I'm bad for black America. I'm not supporting black marriages. Here's why you see such a rise in single parenthood. I do not talk about single parenthood at all in my book, but they think that I'm just saying like, you know, this is, I'm saying black women don't need a black man. Read the book and then you can email me about this conversation. But as sure as my name is Chris Marsh, I get that kind of um, pushback all the time because people just assume what I'm talking about in the book and that's not what I'm saying at all. But so you have to read the book to kind of understand exactly what I'm saying. But I get that without people that have read the book. But people who do read the book, I get a lot of pushback because one of the arguments that I make in the book, <clears throat> and it's interesting because when I first wrote the book, I was um, afraid that people would challenge me, afraid that people would cha challenge me on some of the arguments that I was making. And a few arguments that I was making, I thought I would get challenged, but I don't get challenged there. We can talk about that if you want to. But here's where I do get challenged a lot. One of the arguments that I make in the book is that if we want to be more inclusive of black love, as opposed to like this mother father I idea um, or husband and wife idea, how about we think about the way in which we define family? So in America, the way in which we define a family, and I'm basing this on the Census Bureau, which is kind of the gold standard for data collection in the US. A family is someone you're related to by blood, marriage, or adoption. So I, Chris Marsh, if I don't fit that category, because I'm single and I'm living alone, and not saying the book is necessarily about me, I would not show up in the data set as a family. I would show up as a household, but I would not show up as a family. And so I'm arguing that we need to redefine family and I should be considered a family of one. And some people are like, absolutely, yes, I can see why that is the case. Other people say, oh, no, 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 no. Family has always been more than one person and you have to be related and so on and so forth. So to supplement my argument, I say that you can either be a family of one or we should be able to institutionalize augmented families, which gets back to the argument that I was making before. We have these non-romantic nurturing relationships. They're not related by blood, marriage, or adoption, but sometimes these relationships, i.e. friends, are closer to us than our own family. We should be able to develop an augmented family and be recognized in different spaces and places. Here's why I think this conversation is really important and it's universal, whether or not we're here in America or we're talking in another country, another continent. Because when we think about families, sometimes people discriminate in plain sight against people that are not in families. And one way people can wrap their mind around this whenever I talk about this is the tax structure. No matter where you are, single folks tend to pay more in the tax structure than do married folks or people that are in a family. And so it's a great book by a scholar named Dorothy Brown. And she wrote this book called The Whiteness of Wealth. And one of the things she argues in her book is that Everybody should file taxes as a single person. And I think that's a great idea. And I'm, I'm arguing if we can't file as a single person, everybody should be able to file as a family and I should be considered a family of one. So I get a lot of pushback simply because I use the word single to think I'm not promoting marriage. I am all for marriage. I'm not anti-marriage. And then people give me pushback when I try to think, when we think more critically about some of these terms that we use and have to think about whether or not family is a way to discriminate in plain sight. Oh, wow. I, I figured that would be the, that would be one of the pushbacks you would get. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Tiara, when you get family of one, what comes to your mind? Think of one person. Exactly. <laughs> but it's like, you're not allowed to say that because how dare you be a family of one, you know? It's ridiculous because it's like, you must be partnered. It's a thing. Right. It's a thing. You, how dare you say, what? So it's like, you're a family of one, one out. Is it like, do you, it doesn't mean that you have a child. Like, no, it's just me, myself and I. It would blow people's mind and their conversations and arguments. But again, it's really important that we redefine so many things. This is the worst degree. Things have changed. Things are changing. Also, not everybody is going to have the lock of partner. So where do you put them? Right. And see, the reason, and, I, and I'm just trying, to, at the end of the day, at the when it's all said and done, I'm not necessarily concerned about the word family so much. I What I really am concerned about is how some people are advantage, ad, get advantages because they're in a family and others don't. You, if you want to call me X, Y, and Z, you can call me that. Please just make sure I get the same advantages that a family gets. And the reason why I think that this is a really important conversation, which is one of the main arguments or one of the main crux of the book, I'm trying to get people to understand that when we talk about singlehood, 
especially in Black America, it's not just an individual conversation. We have to overlay structure into the conversation. So one of the things I consistently say in the book and whenever I talk about the book is that we have to understand that structural forces constrain our personal choices. If I were to say that differently, racism constrains our personal choices. If I were to give you an example so you could wrap your mind around it, if I, Chris Marsh, want to marry another heterosexual Black man who owns a PhD, makes 150 US dollars, has, owns his, has his own home, and has estate planning in place, they're simply not there. And so it's not so much that, it, it has to be a structural conversation. It cannot just be like, oh, something's wrong with me. That's why I'm not partnered. And people unfortunately leave it at the individual level. But I'm pushing back saying we have to have a structural conversation when we're talking about singlehood, because especially in Black America, there's just some racism has limited the choices for some people. And we have to have that conversation. Fantastic. And this brings me to my next question. In the Love Jones cohort, you explored how Black women view their single and living alone status. Is this status often a matter of choice or circumstance? And how do these women navigate this status, especially in the light of sometimes judgmental nature of the Black community towards single and child-free women? Mm. 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 So, you know, so one of the things I think is really, really important. So the book just came out in audio book, I believe. Oh, August, because we're in September now. So it came out last month. And so one of the things everywhere I go, I tell people you have to read the afterword because I don't typically read the afterwords in book, but a real, lot of the really good stuff is in the afterword. One of the things I'm explicit about in the afterword or in the end of the book, I tell people after reading this book, I hope you're just as likely to ask somebody, why are you married? as you are to ask somebody, why are you single? Mm. We always, listen, listen. We always ask single people, what? why are you single? Mm -hmm. And so much so, the people in the cohort talked about how they had to get their whole narrative ready. So when they get to the family function, to the family dinner, to the holiday dinner, they have to have a whole conversation, a whole narrative that they plan out because they're gonna be asked that question. But we don't ask married people, why are you married? And so we need to be asking everybody or we need to be asking nobody, but <laughs> don't just ask single folks because the problem in that is that we're normalizing marriage again, right? So I think it's really important the way in which we think about uh, singlehood. Now, so to the point to your question, directly to your question, especially if you understand that structural forces constrain personal choices. Why are you asking me such an individual question? Why aren't I married? There's structural forces we have to talk about and we have to think about. So here's what we talked about in the book. I asked people in the cohort whether or not they were single by choice or by force. And a lot of people talked about how they were single by choice, but then they talked about how circumstances force them to be in a space where they're like, I'm choosing not to be in a relationship or to date right now. So it really is an amalgamation of both choice and force or, or circumstances. Nevertheless, with that being said, again, I think the much larger overlaying context is that structural forces have constrained their personal choices before they even get themselves into the dating market. And that's the part that that's the connection that's not always made. So your personal structural forces has constrained your personal choices. But of the personal choices that you have, you're like, I'm good. I'm going to go ahead and just leave myself out of this dating market for a while. And overwhelmingly, people were happy with their singleness. They were happy with their singleness. But I also want to be very balanced in my conversation. Part of the reason why they're very happy in their singleness is because they built a network, family, friends, um, these augmented families that I talked about to help them through uh, their, their singlehood or help them with their singlehood. So we often think that love has to be between a husband and a wife or between two husbands and two wives, but it can be between non-romantic nurturing relationships. 
But it's also really important for us to understand that although we have these augmented relationships, there was a little bit of loneliness that the singles talked about. But I want to be really clear. It wasn't this chronic loneliness whereby they pulled the sheets up over their head. They stay in the bed for six weeks. They close the blinds. Their room is dark. No, it's situational. It's mild and it's a very short segment of time. For example, like People in America, people may be, single people may get a little lonely around Valentine's Day. That's a day where you're supposed to like, you're supposed to celebrate the people you love. I don't understand why you can't celebrate the non-romantic nurturing people you love. Why does it have to be the romantic ones? But I digress. Sometimes people said like maybe around like New Year's Eve, you're supposed to always have somebody to kiss on New Year's Eve. But they talked about it in very short snippets of time. It's like a day or so. They have they have their friends, they have their networks, they hang out with their people, they do themselves, whatever that means, and then they're feeling better the next day. So overall, they're highly happy with their decision. They um, embrace their singlehood. If it happens, great. If it not, they are still living their lives. And when they do get those little hiccups where they feel a little lonely, they have ways and mechanisms to get through that and get through that in very quick kind of um, in a very quick kind of fashion. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that response. So it, and it's also pretty interesting to observe that success, successful unmarried women like Tracy Ellis Ross. We have Jen mm -hmm. Unaji in Nigeria. We have mm -hmm. Elvina Ibru. They are, they often face more scrutiny regarding their status than their male counterparts who are unmarried. What do you think is responsible for this? What do you think contributes to this? Right. Um, so again, you have to read the afterword because I kind of talk about some of that in the book. Here's what I think is really important. And I think um, whether or not you're a black woman in America, you're on the continent of Africa, you're in uh, the UK somewhere, people constantly want to police what we do. <laughs> they want to tell us how big our butts can be, how big our butts can't be. They want to tell us how long our hair should be, how natural our hair should be or shouldn't be, how loud we should or should not be, who we, sh who we should and should not marry, how many children we should and should not have. I don't know why people insist on wanting, try wanting to try to police black women. Let black women be. Let them do whatever they want to do. We do not police black men, or I would argue probably any other group the way in which we police black women. And I don't know if they think we're the path of least resistance, which is so not the case historically. But for some reason, people all constantly want people constantly want to police black women and always want to look at like what they should be doing, how they should be dressing, how they should be acting. And I can I consistently say, keep black women's names out of your mouth. Let us do exactly what we want. Unapologetically, okay. Dr. Curry. I wish I <laughs> okay, I love it. Absolutely. But you know what is so funny though too? Tracy Ellis Ross in particular, she talks about how, you know, she's uh, you talks about her single the singlehood. She talks about it in a very uh, affirming kind of ways, but people are still emphatic, oh, she must be lonely. Oh, she must want somebody. I'm like, why do you I'm like even when you hear it out of people's mouths, they think like, because we've been conditioned from a very young age. It's so funny, and I love telling the story. I have a friend that lives here in America and he recently got married and him and I were talking one day and he's like, I just like light skinned black women, which I talk about colorism in the book as well. And so he was like, I just like light skin. But by the way, his wife is very light skinned. He's like, I just like light skinned black women. And so I looked at him, looked him dead in his face and I said, no, you don't. And then I proceeded to say, you've been conditioned from a very young age that closer to white is right. I would respect you and appreciate you if you said that, that you've been conditioned and you bought into it hook, line, and sinker. But instead you're like, I just like, I just like light-skinned black women. No, you don't. I also believe we can take that same conversation and overlay it on the idea of marriage. I think from a very young age, we were told we have to be partnered. We have to be partnered. You have to be in a relationship. And anything which is really can be really dangerous because again, it gets to the point where people end up in these relationships. Now we didn't say, I didn't say you have to be in a good, healthy, fulfilling relationship. You just have to be married. And people just end up married, but these relationships are oppressive, 
toxic and even abusive. But you've been told from a very young age, this is what you're supposed to do. So you stay in those relationships. And I'm like, oh no, I'm pushing back against that hard. And when you have a Tracy Ellis Ross, who was talking about her singlehood and talking about it in very affirming kind of ways, people, it, it's a disconnect in their mind. They were like, there's no possible way she can be happy. I've been taught from a very young age, the only way to be happy is to be partnered and or to be married. And so it's to be honest, it's not always easy to have this conversation because some people are so stuck in their ways. They think all these lonely people are sitting up crying every night. <laughs> I'm so lonely. I want somebody. I was like, I wish married people would be honest. I really wish married people would be honest and talk about how lonely they might be in their relationships. Uh oh, it might. <laughs> I, I say to T, I say, I would lie about so many things, but as girls, as women, do not let us lie about motherhood marriage and childbirth why are you lying let's talk about it do not don't hold back you can be partnered and be miserable you can be partnered and you, because you you desperately want to be so married you're in a partnership where you're being oppressed abused and you you're being controlled but because you have to remain a missus someone you're just there and you're just there like i'm fine i'm Girl, you're not. Blink twice if you're not happy. But right, right. And see, that's and that's kind of the point. Married people. Well, I had a I had a dear friend of mine who was single for a while, and then she got married. She said, as soon as I got married, then married people wanted to talk about how bad marriage was. We had this conversation this morning. Yeah, I would and I would admonish married people to just be more honest because I think single people are like, okay, we're looking over there, like, okay, there's it's always the grass is always greener on the other side. If I can just get married, I'll be okay. But I was like, married people need to be more honest. They absolutely need to be more honest. And Tracy Ellis Ross is standing in her singleness and she's being honest, and people are not trusting it. And similarly related to the conversation, and I think I put it in a footnote in the book, and I as a scholar had to grapple with this because um, only I interviewed 62 people and only two people talked about sex. And so I decided to put it in a footnote to, to show that only two people talked about sex. And people have argued me down. They're like, well, you just didn't ask the right questions. Well, maybe they just didn't feel comfortable talking to you and your research team. I was like, why are we equating singlehood with sex? In particular, why are we equating singlehood with being promiscuous? The subtle assumptions that all these singles are out here having all this sex. I interviewed 62 people and only two people talked about sex. And so I think it's, it's, it's short-sighted and it's naive and it's immature to say, just because you're single, you're automatically out here having a, set, a whole bunch of sex or being promiscuous. The two don't necessarily go hand in hand. And again, if we're talking about um, married folks, let's talk about how much sex you are or not, are not having in your relationship too then. Let's talk about that, so. Yeah, because you have so many married people who say, oh, I'm always busy, I do this, I do that, I don't even have time for sex. I thought, I'm like, okay. And you find out, and you're like, oh. I thought you guys said it was just single people that weren't getting some, but apparently they, how do we say it? They are not getting it as well. Because <laughs> in marriage, it's like when you wake up, you're going to work till you sleep. Right. You have right. time, but the time is for others. It could be your children, right. your husband, the house itself. So when you right. project these things on single people, it just may be that you're screaming for help, but we cannot tell because you're not being honest. Right. And I think a really, um, and I have to talk about this, a really easy question, but I think it's got a lot of implications and people have to really think through this. Kind of gets back to the conversation I was having earlier about being conditioned from a young age. It's a small question, but I think it has big implications. Why do you want to be married? That is a question everybody should ask themselves. I think it's a really, because, because is it because oh, I've always been told I need to be married because I want to be middle class? Because I have, because one of the arguments in the social science literature is that, and at one point this was the case, but the labor market has changed globally. Before you had to be partnered to try to get be married to try to catapult yourself into middle class status. But now you have these people that are doing well, they're making six figures, they're buying houses, they're owning property, they're owning companies, and they don't necessarily have to be married. And so it's not an, and maybe it's not an economic thing. So why exactly do you want to be married? And, and this brings me to my next question about when you see moms or you see single men and when people ask why, just like you said, why do you ask married people? Why do you want, why do you want to, when you, say, when you ask single people, why are they not married? 
do we ask married people why they are married and this brings me to my next question with childbirth as we witness a great number of people particularly women choosing to be single child free and live alone it raises questions about enjoying this status and living authentically dr marsh do you have any tips for individuals on embracing and enjoying this status while res while resisting societal pressure to conform to traditional norms right so i yes i wrote a whole book about it like buy the book i think the book will so it's really great because i've gotten there's three compliments that i get from the book one i hear people tell me that i've been seen for the first time so thank you that is such a huge compliment for the book number two i am a professor so people say i learned something even sociologists say like i learned something so it's so great to hear that. And then three, my younger college students, black females in particular, say, Dr. Marsh, thank you. You started a movement. You gave us another narrative for the way in which we can envision our lives. People often think when you go to college or as you get older, you, you can get all the degrees you want, but if you don't have an MRS degree, <laughs> that's all that really matters. I mean, if you don't not if you're not married to someone, yes. that's all that matters. And so I think the book is the book is actually a love story to singles. And I'm happy that there's another narrative out there. And I'm like, live your absolute best life. Because again, why do you think if you get married, it, you're, everything's gonna be okay? And people often talk about, well, you know, I don't want to die alone. Again, I think that we've been the, like social media um, institutions have instilled in us this fear of dying alone. And it's a fear that we now kind of like grapple, grapple with and we have internalized. And because we're like, we're afraid of dying alone, we decide to marry somebody who may not be good to us. Again, maybe abusive, maybe a toxic relationship, but at least I have somebody that's gonna care for me when I get older. There's some data that's out in it. I was, I was trying to find the person that was citing it, that spouses are leaving their spouses when their spouses are sick because they don't know how to deal with a sick spouse. Oh, yes. We, why read do you, we read it a lot. Yes. Why, so why do you think it's because you're married, your spouse is gonna show up for you? Your life friends. is taken care of by your friends, your mother, your sisters, Danny, your partner. Your friends are going to show up for you. Cultivate your friendships because when you're old and you need somebody that's going to be there for you, your friends will be there for you. You will not be alone if you have yourself some friends. And I was talking to a young group of women earlier and they were saying, as I age, I'm not really worried about having a spouse. I'm really worried about having those really close friendships because that's what I see. I saw with my grandmother, with my mother. And I want to, I'm in college now and I want to cultivate those. In America, I'm not sure where they talk about find your best friends that you'll have for the next 60 years of your life. I hear go to go to college and get yourself a husband, but I don't hear the conversation about find your best friends that you will have for the next 60 years. I don't hear that conversation. And so I think it's really important that we celebrate our singleness. We stand confidently in our singleness. And here's, here's the way I think about it. If you're not confident and happy and healthy and whole in your singleness, you should not even consider being in a relationship yet. You need to stand confidently as your individual, as your whole self, before you even think about a relationship. But if you think that the relationship is going to make you whole, I'm not sure that that relationship has the ingredients it needs to succeed. Oh my God. Thank you so much. You know, oh. like, I really enjoyed talking to you. Like, this is very enlightening. The fact that, oh, pain, build your friendships, get more friends. Friends are going to be the ones that will stay with you through, like, they're the ones that they will be there. They, are, they, they were there before your partner and probably will be there after your partner. So friends- Even whilst in partnership. Yes, they'll always be there. So it's very important to make friends. So this is like my major takeaway from this, the fact that Having a network, having yes, a network and importantly important. not sharing the network because how do you just abandon all of your friends and put all of this love, light, energy into, into one partner. person? But you know, I also think, I also, I also get offended when people say, oh, I want to be in a relationship or I'm not in a relationship. No, 
you're not in a romantic relationship, but you have a not a lot of non-romantic nurturing relationships that you're forsaking, that you're ignoring, that you're putting giving no credit to when you say, oh, I want to be in a relationship. Excuse me? My girl, what are you saying? Are you saying you don't see that you don't my time? Right. Right, right, right. That's so I'm like, you have to say like, I need people to just specify now. I want to be in a romantic relationship and explain why you want to be in a romantic relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. Like this is, this is, this has been wonderful. Like I totally had fun and learned so much. Thank you so much for doing this with us. It is my pleasure. Okay. So there's a couple of things. If people decide to get the book, there's a couple of things I want to say about the book real quick. Um, and I highly recommend that you get the book because uh, I do think that it uh, it's not what I have heard, what people have told me. It's not the kind of book that you're going to just pick up. You're going to say, I'm going to sit on the couch and read it over the weekend. It's not that kind of book, which I didn't necessarily need it to be that kind of book. But what I've heard people say is like, it's the kind of book where you'll read something. You're like, wait, what did she just say? Let me put this down. Let me go think about it. And let me come back to it. <laughs> And I didn't necessarily want to write it that way, but that's just the way it came out. So I do think that everybody can get something from the book. Singlehood is a universal conversation. I decided to insert myself at the single living alone, black middle class stage, but singlehood is a universal conversation. And here's what I think is interesting about being single. And depending on how you, how you think about this, um, People have always been, we, people know what it's like to be black. People know what it's like to be a woman. Only some people know what it's like to be black. Only some people know what it's like to be a woman. But we've all held the title of singlehood. Single. All of us have held that title at some point in time. So if we read the book, I think it can strengthen our relationships if we're in a relationship. If we're single, it can help strengthen us as individuals, as singles. And whether or not you're Black or not, I think that you can just have a really good conversation about how we think about singlehood and class dynamics. So everybody can learn something from the book. But when you're reading the book, it's important to understand that it is an academic book. And so the introduction and chapter one are very theoretical. I'm not a very theoretical person, so I had to copy edit the book before it came out. And I was so bored reading the introduction to chapter one, and I wrote it, and I wrote it. So it took me an entire day to copy edit the introduction in chapter one. Once you get to, hold on, your, your brain is gonna hurt in chapter one and the introduction. Your brain will probably hurt if you're not a theoretical person. But if you hold on till chapter two, chapters two through 10, I was really emphatic about writing a book that even if you don't have a PhD, you can pick this book up, learn something from it and understand the arguments that I'm making in the book. So for the theory people, introduction in chapter one is for you. For everybody else that's interested in just understanding singlehood, chapters two to 10 are for you. I also put in the footnotes, I also have footnotes in the, in a lot of footnotes in the book, and I put them at the end of the page if you get the hard copy. Or in the audio book, um, I'm not sure where they are. But part of the reason why I did that is because my editor said, I tend to go off on a tangent when I, when I, when I write. I can't imagine him saying that. Uh, but you know, I can talk and talk and talk and talk. So I can write and write and write and write. And so he said, if you feel like you're going off on a tangent and you're, you're going away from a main point that you're making, put it in a footnote, but keep your footnotes to a minimum. So I have 120 footnotes in the book. <laughs> I had a whole lot of things I wanted to say that didn't make it in the book. So please read the footnotes. Some of the really interesting things are in the footnotes. And I think you'll really uh, get a better understanding of some of the co background context uh, if you read footnotes. So please do read the footnotes and then read the afterwords. I think the afterword poses about 10, 10 or 12 really important questions we should be asking ourselves about singlehood after reading the book. Thank you. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here and chat with you this morning. So thank you so much for having me. We're Thank delighted. We're delighted to have you. You are delighted. You're so you're you're full of life. You're so wonderful, really. What an enlightening conversation, Dr. Chris Marsh. Your work reshapes our understanding of singlehood and living alone. Honestly, T, if there's anything that I enjoy the most about speaking to Dr. Chris is our bubbly. She's so bubbly and our exciting. Bubbly energy. <laughs> she is full of life. And yes. if, if we're left to us, could, we could we have could this conversation. Hours. For hours, for hours. It was it was really insightful, and she yes. said so. She said, 
or it's really important that we have a network yes one person cannot be your network one person being just your partner so many people have how do i put it so many people have turned their partners into their whole lives yes and dr chris is saying that it's really important to have a network also in how in our conversation she mentioned how when the woman is ill you're more likely to be cared for by your parents your siblings your community more than your partner because we had cases where men are likely to abscond or leave their wives when when they're they're sick sick, yes so if you do not leave life having a community what happens as you grow older if you don't invest in friendships if you don't invest in a community if you don't invest in a network it's it's you know it's it's going to be difficult to navigate life because even when your partner is there you still need friendships you still need people that you share the same ideals with not just your partner and to our listeners remember that life is full of choices and each one should be celebrated free from societal judgments okay that's a wrap for today's episode of the counter narrative podcast thank you for joining us and until next time keep questioning challenging and amplifying your voices stay curious stay informed and remember your perspective matters